time we met, um, I was talking about Jesus, and if y'all remember, we went through the great ecumenical councils of the early church, some of the heresies, different ways of misunderstanding the person of Jesus, and how the church got clarity. So, and I always said, you know, when I ended up out there with Jesus, I always felt like we were leaving things sort of incomplete. So I developed a list of the 10 qualities about Jesus that I find most attractive. I'm going to be talking about those tonight. Uh, before I get in, and then we're going to talk about the liturgical year as well. Before I get into those 10 qualities, though, I did get one card which had a question on it from the last session, and it was about the clergy sex abuse uh, crisis. I meant to bring the card with me, but I left it at the house. So but I'm going to reconstruct it from memory and then try to answer it. So the, the two elements of it were the church is doing a lot to detect and respond to abusers and, and uh, the church is also trying to make sure that there's proper screening and all that sort of thing. But the question was, uh, is the church also being diligent about seminary formation people are being trained to be priests and what is the church doing with that and i can tell you that that has been a central focus of the church um, at least since 2002 when they did the charter for the protection of children and young people and i'll also add a bishop spaulding and really before bishop spaulding father mike when he was the administrator he has now uh they've now implemented a multi-day evaluation process for seminarians. So they have to go through a multi-day psychological evaluation. So they really are trying to be super diligent about the people that they accept now as candidates in the seminary. The second part of the question was, what are we doing to help um, families to create uh, an environment where virtues are taught so that people don't grow up with uh, such a destructive tendency? And that's a more complex question. And the reason that's more complex is because um, the difficulty of psychologists even of determining why a person has an orientation to abuse children is not an easy thing for even mental health professionals to figure out. You would like to say, well, let's teach them about the virtues and they would learn about the virtues and learning about the virtues would keep them virtuous but our experience as human beings is that simply learning about virtues doesn't necessarily equate to being able to live that virtuous life. So I'll give you the example with alcohol. You can teach people about temperance, and people who don't have a problem with alcohol learn from your teaching about temperance, and they begin to balance their use of alcohol. But if a person really has the illness of alcoholism, you can teach all you want about temperance, but that is not going to change the behavior because there's something at work that is greater than the lack of knowledge. So, um, so and, and they do say that the majority of people who abuse children were actually abused as children. So that's part of the dynamic. But the other side of the coin is the vast majority of people who were abused never become abusers. So that's a very small percentage. So that's why we're trying to answer that question. Um, so this is obviously the church is trying to deal with uh, the human condition, and the human condition is prone to failure in a lot of different and serious ways. So um, that's kind of my sideline about that. All right, so uh, I did want to give you my top 10 qualities about Jesus, why I find him, the qualities about Jesus I find most attractive, and some of them are gonna sound very familiar. Number one, uh, that he was fully human in every way that we are, except for sin. And the reason I think that's most important is because we don't believe in a God who does not understand what it's like to walk the human journey, but one who entered into our humanity in every way. In fact, was tempted and tested, Hebrews says, in every way that we are tempted and tested. So he knew what it was like to make friends. He knew what it was like to feel loneliness. He knew what it was like to grieve and lose people that he loved. He knew what it was like to be betrayed. He experienced the agony of suffering and death. So every human, authentically human experience, he understands from the inside. So for me, that is absolutely core to what we believe about Jesus. So we do not have a God 
who is unable to sympathize with our human journey because he entered fully into that human journey. Now, we could also add the words, except for sin, as we know, uh, but I will also add as a sideline to that, because of that, Jesus didn't make himself a stranger to sinners, but rather reached out to them and connected with them. And made them. He, he lived in solidarity with sinners. So he went into the waters of the Jordan, where John was baptizing sinners, into the water with them. So he had table fellowship. So the fact that we human beings fall away from the will of God for us did not mean that Jesus was more distant, but rather that he reached out with greater compassion. So that too should give us consolation in the midst of our human condition. A uh, second thing is uh, about Jesus that I'm very attractive <clears throat> is not only was he fully human, but he was fully God, fully divine. And uh, for me, that means that when we wonder what God is like, and there are a lot of different competing descriptions in our world today of what God is like, if Jesus was fully God, and we believe that, that we only have to look at the face of Jesus and his human story and the way he lived and preached and taught and ministered and died to see what the heart of God looks like. So for me, Jesus is the perfect reflection of God. So I want to know what divine mystery is all about. Jesus himself embodies and, and brings that to flesh for us. Third quality um, is the incredible healing presence that Jesus was. How many of y'all got to come and see the Gospel of Mark proclaimed on that Saturday night here at St. Henry? One thing that the a priest said who did the Gospel of Mark, which I never realized before, was that in the Gospel of Mark there's something like 13 healings. And when you look at each of the healings in the Gospel, it's the whole human person that gets healed. So you have uh, every part of the body, from lameness to withered hands to ears and eyes, to inability to speak, to even the private areas of our body, the woman who had the hemorrhage. So all the elements of the human person get healed in the presence of Jesus. And so uh, whatever the affliction was, whether it was a body, mind, or spirit, evil tormented by evil spirits, uh, trapped in guilt, whatever it was, uh, Jesus, his presence communicated healing. And people wanted to be close to him. Remember the story of a woman who thought, if I could just touch his tassel, I'll be made well. And she was made well. So, so for me, this healing presence of Jesus. Also, um, there's that great story of the Gospel of Mark, which is so dramatic. It's really dramatic. It's dramatic in Mark's Gospel. This man is across the sea at the pagan areas, and he's in the tombs. And it says that he couldn't be even chained up. And people were afraid of him, so he lived in the tombs, a place of death. And so he was wounded in his relationships with everybody. He was wounded with himself. He was beating, he was cutting himself up and beating himself up with stones. And he was apart from God. And Jesus healed the man. He set him free from those afflictions. And uh, when the townspeople came back and saw him sitting on the right mind, they were like, ooh, please leave. Tell Jesus, please leave our country. We don't know how to deal with this, this human being that's been restored to his full humanity. So, uh, number four, the love and compassion that Jesus embodied. Um, one of the most powerful scenes for me, the disciples have been out preaching the gospel. They're tired. Jesus says, let's get the boat. Let's go to the other side to an alleyway place and rest a while. He knows they need rest. And they go across the sea, and a great crowd knows where they're going. They've walked around, and they're waiting. And it says Jesus got out of the boat, and he saw the vast crowd. And the, the words in Greek, his heart was moved with compassion. It's a gut story sensation. So when you see something that makes your guts turn, that's the kind of compassion. Because Mark tells us that we're like sheep without a shepherd. So the love that he had and embodied and his compassion for people. Number five, uh, the way that he included uh, the outsiders, the least. Uh, again and again, he's always drawn to those who are on the fringes of society. So whether it's children who in the first century didn't matter and he would pick them up and blow 
bless them. Uh, whether it was women, he had women disciples unlike other rabbis in the first century. Whether it was the lepers or sinners or publicans or tax collectors, prostitutes. Um, he reached out to the little ones, the poor, the ones on the edges, to make them part of God's kingdom, to invite them into the heart of things. In fact, he said, you know, the little, the least, shall be first in the kingdom, and the first shall be least or last in the kingdom. So Jesus is his presence, especially to those who most need divine connection. Um, I often say, Jesus wasn't into equality about he's going to treat everybody the same, but he treated each person with the love that they needed at that particular given moment. And those of you who are parents, if you have more than one child, you get that, don't you? Because sometimes one child needs your attention at one moment because they're really wrestling with something, so you go to that child. That's what you do. You go to the child that feels on the outside at that given moment. Uh, this, the sixth quality is Jesus' radical call, a worthy challenge. So he demands of us that we become fully human like himself. He never lets us settle for part way. He doesn't say, you can be kind of loving toward each other. He says, no, you have to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your strength, all of your soul. You have to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And he makes these radical demands. And if Jesus said anything less than that, uh, would we really want to follow him? If somebody strikes you on one cheek, turn, offer the other one to them. Uh, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless your persecutors. Don't curse them. It's so beyond our normal way of human acting, isn't it? Somebody punches me or harms me in some way. It was my natural human reaction. You know, smack them back, right? right? So, but he's calling us to love in a way that is beyond anything that we would normally do. It's so the challenge of becoming the person that he created us to be. And he says at one point, if you want to follow me, you have to be willing to let go of your family, those that are closest to you, all the material stuff in your life. In fact, he says, you have to die to yourself and take up your cross and follow me. So that's hard, isn't it? So he's, Jesus is challenging us to live life in an extraordinarily new human way. Uh, blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called children of God. Those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. They will have their fill. The single-hearted, the pure of heart, the humble, close to the earth. And it's such a, a worthy challenge when you think about it. Number seven, I love the remarkable freedom that Jesus had. So when you think about uh, what does religion often do to people, it often traps people. And Jesus saw that clearly. He looked at the scribes and Pharisees who demanded of people difficult things, but would not lift a finger to budge them. He said, you are whitewashed sepulchers, beautiful to look at on the outside, but inside full of filth and dead people's bones. You know, so he challenged those who were religious in a way that was destructive to human beings. In fact, on one day, he heals this person on the Sabbath day, and they're waiting to get him. He's violating the Sabbath, he's working on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, you hypocrites, you know, if your ox or ass got into a ditch on the Sabbath, you would pull that animal out. But this child of God has been liberated from enslavement. And do you not know that the Sabbath was made for human beings, not human beings for the Sabbath? So everything God has done, Jesus recognizes, is not to attract the human person, but to set us free. So uh, it's turning the world upside down in the way that most people think who are super religious. People who get super religious get very judgmental and hypocritical and beat everybody else up who are not doing what they should be doing, right? So we start, because we're perfectionists ourselves, so we gotta put that on everybody else too. So Jesus says, if you wanna be perfect, then you must be 
perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, who lets the sun rise on the just and the unjust, um, and sends the rays to fall on the good and the wicked. So God's love, it seems to be sort of free, it's indiscriminate. Um, it's no wonder, by the way, they crucified him, the religious people. That kind of freedom is a frightening thing. Uh, number eight is communion with God. Uh, I love how the Gospels tell us that Jesus would go off to the desert mountaintop to be alone. And when he was alone with God, one, one translation says he was absorbed in prayer. He called God Abba. Uh, it's a Hebrew a term of affection for one's father. Probably the closest in English for us is dad, something like that. And someone said they never really understood it. There were a Hebrew scholar who had gone to Israel and I saw little kids, Abba, 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 calling their fathers. But one day he was in the airport in New York and this old Jewish man who arrived from Israel went in the airport and his son was waiting for him at the airport, his adult son. And his adult son went over to his father and embraced him warmly and he said, Abba, Abba. It's so good to see you. Uh, and so the intimacy that Jesus had with Abba was unparalleled. And yet he said, you know, when, when you pray, pray our Father. So we all, we all belong to that relationship. He's invited us into it, sons and daughters of God most high. Um, number nine, the way he died for us. Um, if most of us were abandoned by the people closest to us, betrayed by one of those we had chosen, uh, and tormented, uh, we might have some element of bitterness and hatred about the whole thing. But it's remarkable on the cross, Luke says in particular, uh, the words of Jesus on from the cross, our Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Someone said, not only does he ask for forgiveness for us, but he even gives a good reason for it. They don't, they don't understand what they're doing to me. So, but the love that he had to the very end on the cross, that he gave himself fully and held nothing back for us, uh, the cross is that central mystery that someone would love that much, that he would lay down his life for us while we were yet sinners. You know, and is it Paul that says, you know, some of us might die for a good person, but it's rare that anybody would die for a sinner. Mm -hmm. So that he would die freely. And someone made the observation, if there were only one of us that needed to be redeemed, he would have died for us. So uh, the way he died for us. Uh, and then number 10, the last quality, uh, his ongoing presence with us. So his promise at the end of Matthew's Gospel was, know that I am with you always. I will always be with you. And in John's Gospel, he says, uh, I will come, I will send the advocate, the paraclete. The paraclete will make a home in you. And the Father and I will make a home in you. We will dwell within you. And so the belief that we carry as Christians, that, we're, that we carry the presence of the risen Lord in our being, when we were baptized, so we're, we're connected to that risen Christ. And in Matthew's Gospel, he says, where two or three of you gather, I'm there with you. So, so if, it, if all the things that I said about Jesus were great before, all the other qualities, and they happened only 2,000 years ago, that would be one thing. But that we believe he is alive and present with us here and now, uh, and comes to us in a multiple set of ways in life, that to me is wonderful. Um, when uh, Cardinal uh, O'Malley was installed as the Archbishop in Boston, they were having an ordination in the cathedral church, I think, and there was a man on the, on the sidewalk outside of the cathedral who was screaming, he was clearly mentally ill, he was screaming, I'm Jesus, I'm Jesus! And um, uh, Cardinal O'Malley said, he is Jesus in a strange disguise. Uh, and it's sort of like Jesus himself saying, you know, whatever you've done for the least of my sisters and brothers, the hungry, the thirsty, the homeless, that be in prison, you did for me. 
So we see the face of Jesus in the faces of the vulnerable that we respond to in love. That's where we meet, again, another place where we meet the resentful of stone. Are there any questions about that? That was a really quick overview of 10 things I love about Jesus. You can write your own list, hopefully. All right, let me know about the specific passage and context that would be helpful. The least ones, there is a passage about the least ones, about scandalizing one of the least ones, and he may be speaking about members of the Christian community at that point, so brothers and sisters in the Christian community. But um, in Matthew 25, the passage I'm referencing, he seems to be referring to any needy person, hungry, thirsty, naked, imprisoned, uh, sick, and specifically, he is talking about the judgment of the nations at that point. So it's the whole world that will be judged on the criterion of love and how we've responded to the least ones. St. John of the Cross, by the way, said the same thing. In the evening of our life, we shall be judged by our love. So which when I was in college, I thought, oh, that's beautiful, I like that. But when you think about what that really means, it's like, oh, wow, it's quite a demand, actually. <laughs> Especially when we're called to love like God. Love one another as I have loved you, Jesus says. That's a bold, again, that's the remarkable challenge of Jesus. Okay. All right, any other questions or observations? All right, so tonight, uh, the main topic, even though I took up some time with this one, that I really want to talk about is uh, the liturgical year and also the liturgy of the church. So liturgy and it comes from Greek words that mean it's from the word for the work of the people. So liturgy is work, but it's also the work of you, you God's holy people. And so the Catholic Church has certain things that it describes or defines as liturgy. That's the quote unquote official prayer of the church. All seven sacraments are part of the liturgy of the church. We'll be talking a lot more about those in the new year, which are the seven sacraments. But beyond that, funeral rites are also part of the liturgy of the church um, and a variety of other liturgical observances and services. Particularly the liturgy of the hours, which I want to talk about for a moment. So one way of describing tonight's topic is this is how we as Catholics make time sacred. So let's start with the day of the week. All right, so how many of y'all been to a monastery? If you never get a chance, you should go to a monastery so come and join them for some of their prayer services. So, uh, say uh, there are Benedictine monasteries in Alabama, Arkansas, um, Indiana that are less than three hours away drive time. Uh, Gethsemane has Trappist monks not far away in Kentucky. Uh, and even, like for example, women religious, the Dominican sisters here in Nashville, you can join them for Vespers in the evening at their chapel. Um, so, the liturgy of the hour. So, St. Paul said at one point, pray always. So, uh, in the early church, there were men and women who went out to the deserts around Egypt who really wanted to live the Christian life with great intentionality. And they took very seriously the words of Paul to pray constantly. And so, they divided up the day into what they called hours of prayer. So, uh, the first hour of prayer in a simple form, I'm going to give you a simple form first, or the hinge hours of prayer are morning prayer and evening prayer. So, the prayer we begin the day with, the prayer that we end the day with. Uh, so, those are kind of what we call the cardinal or most important hours of prayer. So, if we think about that, that basic statement, there's something that all of us can learn from that. Every one of us in some measure should begin our day with prayer. 
So I'm not going to test you to see how many of y'all are doing that at this point. But when I get up in the morning, uh, my thoughts should turn to God when I rise in the morning. And it can be as simple as, thank you, God, for this new day. And Lord, help me to live this day as you want me to live it. To do your will today in all things. That's a very, very simplified, what we call, morning offering. So the beginning of my day, I'm going to offer myself and my day to God, aware that this new day that I've been given is a blessing from God. So uh, if, if you've not been making that a priority, every day you get up, try to start your day with that prayer at some point. Now, many will want to take longer periods of time in the morning for prayer. I find that's my best time of the day to pray because it's quiet. So in the summertime, it's beautiful. I'll go out on the porch and I'll, I'll turn on my fountain and light my oil lamp and watch the sunrise and I'll do my prayer time alone with God. My phone is on airplane mode and nothing will happen on it. So, and Father Bolson knows that's what I'm doing. It doesn't bother me and he's very respectful of that time. Uh, so in, in this time of year, I'm indoors. Uh, I have my electric fireplace and my candle lit. Uh, but I do the same kind of prayer routine. So it's my one-on-one -on -one time with God at the beginning of the day. The second major pinch hour is what they call evening prayer. And this prayer occurs, what they call it, at the lighting of the lamps. So as the sun begins to set and it grows dark outside and you're going to light the evening lamps, at the day's end of work, you should have another cardinal point of prayer. So you guys live, you all live busy lives probably. So you're thinking, when can I fit all this prayer into my day? Some of you may be thinking that. Well, if you have a job and you're working, when you get in your car and start driving home, that's a good inch point to say, God, I did a lot of things today. You know, recall it. What did I do? Did I do it well? Did I do it for your glory and honor? Was I loving? Did I get off track at all? So, you know, God, as I go home to my family or as I'm going home to the next task, whatever it might be, you know, thank you for the work day and help me to kind of go into the next point. So monks, by the way, they, um, in the Benedictine tradition, Benedict talks about ora et labora. You pray and work. So the monks have these hours of prayer in the church, but in between the hours, they're out doing the work of the monastery, whether it's milking cows or building coffins or planting and growing uh, corn, you know, or making good beer or wine. You know, monks are always working on something, so maybe scholarly work. Uh, so those are the two pinch hours. At the middle of the day, they have what is a, a smaller prayer called midday prayer. <clears throat> and so normally at noon, you know, the monastery bells ring and they're drawn in and they have their midday prayer before they eat their midday meal. So, you know, if you want to reflect that in your own busy lives, I don't know how you eat lunch. But could you not stop before you eat your lunch and pause for a moment of gratitude and prayer and reflection to God? You know? um, so even if you only just bless the food that you're about to receive, how many of y'all work at your or eat lunch at your work at your computer screen or something like that? So if you do things like that, and you still have to, you can stop, pause for a moment, and, and thank God for the midday. You know? So midday prayer. Uh, monks also have mid morning prayer and mid afternoon prayer. They also have, um, so pause at nine in the morning, three in the afternoon. So most of us are going to have some pause points during the day of our work, you know, so I might get up and go to the restroom and uh, pause for a moment, recollect myself, thank God. Um, and then uh, mid-afternoon, uh, mid-afternoon stretch break when I'm walking to the restroom or whatever. It's those moments when you have a moment of collective pause to, to lift up your heart and mind to God. Uh, the Eastern tradition, by the way, the ancient church, they had a simple form of prayer that you could pray no matter what you were doing all day long. And it was called the Jesus Prayer. So you just said, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Or some variation thereof. You could even shorten it. Just say, Jesus, oh Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy. You know, so that simple recollection, a sort of like a mantra of the, of the name of Jesus in a prayer, uh, you know, they said they could be out working in the garden and, or, or and utter 
that prayer interiorly, mentally. So you can always pray that way. When you wake up in the middle of the night, you can pray that way. You know, if you want to clear your brain, Jesus, be merciful to me. I praise you, Jesus. I thank you. I love you. I adore you. In some way of speaking uh, to Jesus himself. Um, they also have an office of readings, which gets often connected with morning prayer, more extended reflection on the Word of God and some spiritual writing. And uh, then, right before they go to sleep at night, they have night prayer, so it's the last little hour of the day. And the church encourages you at day's end to do an examination of your consciousness. I found, by the way, a really easy way to do this. So um, I keep a little journal by my bedside table and a pen. And uh, at the day's end, I sit on my bedside for just a moment. And I say, okay, God, where did things, how did things go today in my life? And I do a little plus mark in ways that I was aware of God's presence or responded to God's grace. It might be plus uh, visiting M. You know, it might be a person I visited who was homebound and needed a visit. So that was a moment when I cooperate with your grace. Did I get off track today? Mm, little minus mark. Oh, I was really impatient with that other driver on the, on the road today. You know, I lost my temper. You know, so. The help of this whole thing is to look at it and, uh, and review my day in God's presence and love. To say, is there anything I need to clean up for tomorrow? Yeah, I lost my temper with that person. So tomorrow, God, I want to apologize and go back and fix that. Or, I sometimes I'll notice a little negative. I'll say, I lost my patience with this person. And then I'll put a little plus mark beyond it and say, and I recognized it and I went back and I apologized right away. So I recognize that my failure also led to a grace moment right away in my life. So those kinds of things are helpful exercises before you go to bed at night. And you know, the last thing you can say is, God, I just want to rest in your care tonight as I go to sleep. Part of the night prayer of the church, which I love, is the antiphon for the night prayer. Protect us, Lord, as we stay awake. Watch over us as we sleep. But awake when they keep watch with Christ. And asleep, rest in his peace. It's a great way to kind of end your day. Uh, and to your hands, Father, I commend my spirit for this night. So, uh, so the, the thing that I love about the idea of making the day holy is that we sanctify the day. We make it holy. We're aware that, that we're living this partnership with God throughout the day. This is not just me alone in this world. But I have every reason to turn to God, to give God thanks and praise, I have every opportunity to ask God for help when I don't know what to do. When I'm meeting with someone and I don't know what to say, I can interiorly say, Holy Spirit, give me the right words. Give me wisdom. Help me to know what you want me to do here. So all of those moments of the hours of the day can be made prayer. Someone made the observation, if you look at a sentence in a book, it doesn't just have, or a paragraph, or a page, it doesn't just have punctuation at the end, a period. But all through it, there's punctuation. You have exclamation points and question marks and, and quotation marks and, and uh, dashes and commas and semicolons and colons. And you know, in, in a sense, we should punctuate our day with prayer. You know, we walk outside and it's a glorious morning, the sun's rising. God, what a beautiful day, thank you. You know, uh, we're driving down the road and hearing something really sad on the radio. You know, I heard this really, really sad story about it. I was listening to NPR about this person whose wife and, and pets died in the California fire. And they wouldn't let him go back in to save her because it was too dangerous. Well, so I'm, you know, I'm you know, tearing up in the car. God bless him. That is horrible. I'm sorry that happened to him. God, please give him what he needs right now. So we can ask God for anything at any given moment of the day or night. So wake up in the middle of the night sometimes. I mean, if I wake up, I can't go back to sleep. So one of my favorite things to do is I just take the letter, the, uh, the letters of the alphabet, and I'll either go through from A to Z, thinking about good qualities or people I'm grateful for, things I'm grateful for, or I'll ask the intercession of saints. So you know, I'm just by, by letters and Ambrose, 
you know, pray for us. St. Bernard, pray for us. St. Cecilia, pray for us. Uh, David, King of Israel, pray for us. Um, you know, so I, yeah, and I, I can't think of something I just skip to the next letter, so you don't get stuck in the <laughs> album, you know. Um, all right, so making time holy, making the day holy. Uh, second element for us Christians beyond the day uh, is the week, which is really the gift of God given to humanity, the whole idea of Sabbath rest. It was really our Jewish brothers and sisters that God gave this, entrusted to this command to that you can work six days of the week, but on the seventh day, you must rest. And not only must you rest, but all of your slaves, male and female, and all your animals have to rest. Even the aliens and the foreigners who are living among you, you have to let them rest. This day is for every human being. Nobody gets excluded. So what does this mean? It means that God doesn't expect human beings to be workaholics, to be working ourselves to death, that we need a rhythm to life. And even in the book of Genesis, God does all the work of creating in six days, and on the seventh day God rested. That's what Genesis tells us. Does God need to rest? He has infinite power, infinite energy, he never tires. Of course not. Why does he rest on the seventh day? He sets the example for all of us. He's showing us how to live life the right way. So he's setting a good example. So I will tell you when I was uh, once on, my, on an airplane trip going out west to a retreat, they had in the airline magazine an article by a modern Jewish family that had rediscovered the value of the Sabbath day. And they decided that on Saturday, which is the Jewish Sabbath, that they would do no work of any sort. They, they redefined it for their own family. And what they defined as work was anything that was a burden to any of them and the family to do. So if cutting the grass was a burden, they wouldn't cut grass on Saturday. Paying bills was a burden, they wouldn't pay bills. If doing laundry was a burden, they wouldn't do laundry. Now if gardening was a joy, as a family that loved gardening, they would garden on the Sabbath. If they loved walking in the park, they'd walk in the park. If they loved going to the museums, they'd go to the museums. So they just decided one day a week to give glory and honor to God we're not going to do any sort of thing that makes us think of work, but only things that are truly life-giving, recreative, and joyful. And what they said was, it changed their life, it changed the rest of the week, all the other six days changed, because they've been, wait they've been waiting all their tasks that they didn't get finished during the week. And I started thinking about my own life, and I had a quote-unquote day off, and what was I doing? I was saying everything I couldn't get done, and I was, you know, all the work elements that I didn't get during the week, I was trying to catch up on on my so-called day off. And so I decided to try to practice that idea of Sabbath rest, and it really makes a huge difference. Now for us Christians, of course, our, for most of you, not for a priest, of course, but for most of us, you know, it's the day of the Lord, the day of resurrection, it's Sunday that we give honor and praise to God. So, and I'll just say real quickly that um, being at, at the Eucharistic liturgy, with the community of faith on that day or the evening before at the vigil is the most important way that we honor God on the day of the Lord. It's the place that we get recreated weekly around the table of the Lord. And we need that. It's, it's what we call one of the core essentials of the practice of faith. So you can't live without that. You know, like you, you can't say, well, I cut a lot of exercise when I was 20. I don't need to exercise anymore. You can't say, well, I went to church a lot back in my 20s, so I've got plenty of that, you know. So it's like a living relationship. We have to be connected to it, you know. And so, but, but the other element I would add is, when we were young, uh, I grew up in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, about eight miles south of here. On Sundays, nothing was open. You couldn't find a drugstore that was open or a gas station. Uh, so the whole town shut down. Well, what did that mean? It meant you couldn't do any sort of work like that. So we would usually go to my grandmother's house for dinner. We'd watch you know, The Wonderful World of Disney and the Animal Kingdom, The Wild Kingdom on Disney or whatever the, the four channels offered those days. We would have dinner as a family. In the afternoon, sometimes we would drive and visit relatives that lived out in the country. You know, so we, you know, Sunday was very different than any other day of the week. And we've lost that as a culture. So my encouragement is, for you as individuals and families,
to find a way to keep that day sacred for you that creates a rhythm of life that is life-giving. So be strong defenders of your need to be recreated in, in the image and likeness of God. Don't fall prey to this idea that we're all going to be working all the time and we're, we're what we do. There's something wrong with that. That's not what we're human beings, we're not human doings. So sanctifying the weak is important. Now beyond that, um, there's a brilliance to the church's development of what we call a liturgical year. And one of your handouts tonight is about the liturgical year. And I want to spend just a few moments on that. I think that's really important and helpful. And I'll explain why in just a moment. Never forget this statement. The most important holy day for early Christians was always Sunday. Every Sunday was seen as a mini Easter, the day of resurrection. So, so for Christians, that was kind of the heart of everything. This is the first day of the week when God created the universe out of nothing. It's the day when Christ rose from the dead. It's the day when the Spirit descended at Pentecost. So we honor Sunday as the number one preeminent holy day. So the whole mystery of Christ unfolds every Sunday. But we Christians need to kind of focus on different facets of the mystery of Christ. So we spread that great mystery out over the course of a 365 day year. So there is a heart and a center to the liturgical year. Can you tell me what that heart and center is? What's the core of it, the very center and heart of it? All right, Easter. And Easter begins with the evening before at sunset, the great vigil of Easter. It's probably the most, it's the mother of all liturgies of the church. So you have the most extended liturgy of the word, you have the liturgy of baptisms and confirmation, you have the Eucharist celebrated. So the Easter Vigil itself and then the Easter Sunday liturgies, they are really the center and heart of the liturgical year. But that is intimately connected with what we call the great three days, the, the triduum of Easter, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter together are the Paschal Triduum. HT is Holy Thursday, GF is Good Friday, so Holy Thursday, Good Friday, uh, the Vigil of Easter and Easter, that great three-day window of time from Holy Thursday evening until Easter Sunday morning is called in Latin, the Latin words triduum mean three days, the great three days. This is really the center of everything, so it's the death and resurrection of Jesus. Holy Thursday evening, the commemoration of the Eucharist, when Jesus instituted the Eucharist and washed the feet of the disciples at the Last Supper. Good Friday, the day we mark the death of Jesus on the cross. It's the only day of the year, 365 days of the year, that we do not celebrate the Eucharist. So the, no Mass is celebrated on Good Friday, the day that Jesus died. So we receive communion that day of the service that was consecrated the evening before on Holy Thursday. We commemorate the Passion of John, and we, we venerate the cross, and we pray for the needs of the world. We don't celebrate the Eucharist or other sacraments, except in danger of death. Uh, now, to get ready for that, we need a Holy Week. So we've got a Holy Week with, that begins with Palm Sunday, the week before Easter. And the church, of course, wants us to be spiritually prepared for such a Holy Week. Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday. So we have a 40-day period of time to prepare for that called Lent. So for us Catholics, Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of Lent, that great 40-day period of time that leads up to the Triduum. 
And uh, that's a period of time where we want to be especially focused about all the things that we should be doing throughout the year. What do I mean especially focused? We should really be trying to let go of sin, letting go of things that are not necessary in life. That's why we fast and we give things up that we like. We should be intent on our prayer. We should deepen our life of prayer during this 40 days. We should be intent on loving other people. If loving God is the most important thing we do, acts of love and service should be deepened during those 40 days. So the three great legs of Lent are prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Now, once we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, the joy of Easter can't be contained in a day. So we Catholics have a 50-day season of Easter that leads all the way to Pentecost Sunday. Forty days after Easter, he ascends, so we have Ascension, Thursday, and transfer to a Sunday. Just don't pay attention to that for a moment. Fifty days after Easter, Pentecost, the day the Holy Spirit descends. This great 90-day window of time of Easter and Lent together, the great 90 days, is kind of the heart of our liturgical year. Um, we have a second uh, cycle of seasons focused on another pivotal point in uh, Christ. The mystery of Christ. What would that point be? Christmas. Yes. And Christmas, of course, celebrates the Word becoming flesh, God becoming incarnate, and being born in our world, pitching his tent, John's Gospel says among us. So we go from the mystery of the death and resurrection of Jesus back to the incarnation, to the birth of Jesus. Why do we celebrate it, by the way, on December 25th? It's probably likely that we stole that time period from the pagans, because they used to celebrate the invincible sun. So when the days got shorter and shorter and shorter, you know, this primeval human fear, like we feel it outside today, and when it's dark and cold, don't we? It's just going to disappear forever. The warmth and sun is going to get, this darkness is going to swallow us up. And so when they could start, that so December 21st, a few days thereafter, when they could see that the days were lengthening again, that the light didn't get swallowed up by darkness, they used to celebrate this feast of the unconquered sun, like the sunshine outside. So um, the early Christian church said, we don't need to be celebrating a, a pagan thing like that. Let's celebrate the birth of Jesus, a true light of the and make that the focal point of midwinter. So that's why Christmas is celebrated at that time, that window of time. And again, we don't want to just rush into the Christmas mystery without preparation. So we have four weeks of Advent to get ready for Christmas. I'll also add, though, that Advent is not just about getting us ready for Christmas. Every Advent is also getting us ready to meet Christ at the end of our life on Earth, or at the end of time. So if you listen to the prayers and readings of Advent, especially early, the first couple of weeks, they're all about, get ready, the Lord is coming. You want to see Him face to face, get ready to meet the Lord. So it's all about preparing ourselves to meet Jesus at the end of time, or at the end of our life on Earth, See, the bells are tolling for that purpose. We're calling us to be to Jesus. Um, or the ways that we meet Jesus day by day throughout our life. He comes to us in many hidden ways. So are we awake? Or are we alert? Are we seeing the face of Jesus? And also, just like with Easter, you can't keep Christmas confined to a day of the year. So a Christmas season that follows that goes all the way to Traditionally, January the 6th, the Feast of the Epiphany, but we extend it all the way now to the Baptism of the Lord, which can be uh, up to, to a week beyond Epiphany. I will even say, in the Eastern churches, the Feast of the Epiphany is bigger than Christmas. It is the feast. It's when Christ reveals himself to humanity, to all nations. 
And even the Italians call it Little Christmas. They used to say they're gift giving for that day. So I'm going to make you think differently about our culture thinks about Christmas for just a moment. We Americans love to anticipate things, but when they're finished, we want to be done with them. So, so people put up all their Christmas decorations at Halloween now or Thanksgiving, so being a little exaggerated in some cases. So we have all these weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of Christmas before Christmas gets here. We forget all about Advent, of course, and the spiritual meaning of waiting for Christ to come. And we just want to celebrate Christmas. But then, and play all the Christmas music. I mean, it switched over the week of Thanksgiving on radio stations that I listened to. I'm like, why do they play Christmas music? I remember one day I was Christmas shopping about December 21st or 22nd. And uh, the radio announcer came on and he said, okay, let's play a Christmas song. Christmas is almost finished. I was like, almost finished, and it's even gotten here yet, you know? <laughs> so, and what happens to most of Americans now is what happens on December 26th, you're tired of Christmas, you want to sweep it all up and put it all away and play the house up and forget about it. So, uh, so better for us to say, no, we've just celebrated this incredible mystery of what God did in becoming human. Let's stay here and reflect on that mystery for a while. So the eight days that follow Christmas are the octave of Christmas, the eight days of Christmas, and then the season goes all the way to the epiphany, and then even the baptism of the Lord. So I want to challenge you to think about not taking your Christmas decorations down uh, before the Feast of the Epiphany of the earliest. So try to keep them up. Um, every year, it, the traditional date is January 6th, but it, each, each year it falls on now on the Sunday nearest. So I don't know, I don't know what, what Sunday is that's going to be this year, but it will be on... So the Sunday after Christmas this year is the Feast of the Holy Family, so Epiphany will be the Sunday after that. So it's after the New Year, so you know, don't rush to get rid of Christmas. You know, but really, that's when you should be celebrating Christmas. So, so uh, that's just my countercultural kind of, this is what we're now we celebrate. Or the other thing I will add, too, is that we, we as uh, Catholics, throughout the liturgical year, these, I've kind of pointed out the two major cycles and the, the importance of Sunday. But there are certain feasts of uh, Jesus that take place throughout the year, like the Transfiguration, for example. And feasts especially of Mary uh, that occur almost every single month, and then of other saints. That's called the Santo Valde. So the reason that we remember the saints is they're always pointing us to the person of Christ. So at the center of the liturgical year is the mystery of Christ. It's like circling that mystery every year over and over again, because you can never get enough of it. And you can never exhaust the mystery. When I went to Seattle, I was driving across the George Washington Bridge the first time I went, and it had been cloudy when I got there, so I never saw Mount Rainier. Have you ever seen Mount Rainier? It's a giant mountain. It's like 60 miles away, but it's like, like almost swallows up the skyline of Seattle. So I'm driving across the bridge, and all of a sudden, I got this feeling there was a presence behind me. And I looked out the window, and there was a mountain, just like giant, and it cleared off. I almost wrecked the car on the George Washington Bridge. So then I drove to Mount Rainier, and I stayed at the bottom of one of the lodges, and I hiked on the mountain, and I drove to the lodge as high up as you can get on the road, stayed at that lodge, and I walked around. I drove all the way around the mountain. It's like a 100 mile drive around or whatever. And yet, even though I saw Mount Rainier that way, it was right there, I mean, I could never exhaust it. It's too much. There's too much mystery and beauty about it. You could be there the rest of your life and never exhaust it. So the liturgical year lets us circle around the mystery of Christ because you can never exhaust that mystery. There's always something more to it. And the saints are all pointing us toward Christ. So we celebrate a saint. We're really celebrating how they embody the person of Jesus in their life. All right, so that's just a little bit about how we make time holy. Questions or observations? That's a lot in an hour, isn't it? All right, we're going to go to our tables and break into our small groups and share about this. Uh, and sponsors will go with me to the church for some practice.